In this program, Collins continues his love affair with the diesel. I visit a cliff-top Victorian tourist attraction that's been lovingly restored by some blokes in a pub. Collins joins the night shift at a depot in Bristol, and I tell the tragic tale of the tilting train. Tilting trains, what's that all about? Well, essentially, it's all about this. Cup of coffee. There are three factors which govern the speed of a train round a curve. There's the speed limit of the curve itself, the speed limit of the train, and perhaps most importantly, passenger comfort. Let's face it, trains can go round curves at very high speeds, but not much use if your passengers and their coffees are thrown against the wall. This beautiful train, this testament to 20th century engineering, isn't sat on a siding awaiting its next tour of duty. Instead, it's sitting as an exhibit at the Railway Age in Crewe. Why? Well, this man is eminently qualified to tell us. It's Kit Spatman, the designer of the original tilting system, part of a team that led the world in a revolutionary technology. This is the story of the APTP. We don't have the freedom of movement that people in, say, France have got to be able to bang a new line straight through the middle without worrying anybody. Um, and in the, the 60s, there was a distinct need to uh, improve the services on the West Coast Main Line. That's the one that goes from Glasgow through here uh, and up to, to, to Euston. The, because it's very heavily twisted and it's very steeply graded, um, you can accelerate only so much by making the trains more powerful on the straight, but you've got to make them go around the corners faster. And you can't just make the corner uh, less bendy. Um, so you, in order to make the train go around the corner and for the passengers to be comfortable, the only real solution is to make the body tilt over. And what was your involvement? Uh, I was the de tilt system development engineer for this train's predecessor. That was the gas turbine powered APTE that's currently in the National Railway Museum at York. Certainly the tilt system worked, it did everything that we asked it to do. In this train, uh, it was originally built in order to remove all possible lateral accelerations and present day tilt thinking is that that's actually a bad idea because um, it makes people who are prone to car sickness even more car sick because you can see the horizon going up and down as the train tilts over. And current day tilt systems which were developed on this train don't do that and over the period of uh, development they developed the more modern type of tilt system on this train which is in use in current, current tilting technology. Are we saying then that the, the tilting mechanism on this train worked too well? Yes, I think that's exactly the case. Um, it, it was in fact too good. Certainly the one on APTE was very, very good. It was probably the highest performance tilt system of any train that's ever been built anywhere. So the tilting mechanism worked. It was fast. Why are we sat in the cab of the APT and not running up and down the West Coast main line? There were great hopes for it to be very rapidly into, into what they called it squadron service at the time and there were plans to build lots of um, new squadron trains for, for the, uh, the project. Unfortunately, probably political pressure to put the train into service in 1981, it was a very, very bad winter, it got very bad publicity as you, as you say um, and the train was rapidly taken out of service after that. Sometime after that it was put back into service and in fact ran for a good number of years, although not publicised very well. But unfortunately the government at that particular time were relatively anti-railway um, and the funding was never um, fully put forward and the marketing position had moved on. The railway uh, marketing operations had decided to move their objectives slightly so the need for a, an advanced passenger train like this slowly went away um, and I think although that the the average railway enthusiast was very keen on having it the the businessmen thought in a different way. How, how fast could this train go? Um, this one APTP was designed to run in service at 155 um, it actually in service ran at 125 that is still there on the speedometer um, but uh, one of the APTPs uh, still holds the current UK railway speed record at 162 so it was pretty darn quick. Cosmetically, uh, Rob and the guys here at, at Crew have done a great job on this. It, it, looks, Absolutely. it looks brilliant on the outside, it looks great on the inside. Yes. D does it still have the power to make you annoyed? Yes, it does to a certain extent. You know, I, I can't help but feel that you know, here we are 
20 years down the line, um, and we could be literally running on the line, that line out there, this train could have been running out there with a bit more political will and a bit more money put in the right place. Um, we wouldn't now be buying our technology from Italy for the Pendolinos. Um, it's, it's a great pity that we, uh, that we couldn't have carried on with it. Growing up in the West Country, there was one particular locomotive that everybody loved. We had our class 25s, 31s, 47s, as everybody else did. But not everybody else had the Westerns. What was it about this particular locomotive that made it so loved? Was it its name? They were called Western Champion, Gladiator, King and Emperor. Nobody ever said, what an ugly locomotive. Nobody ever said, does it make a horrible noise? So I'm here at the East Lanks Railway in Bury today to find out why this locomotive is Britain's best loved diesel. The construction of these locos was to be split between Swindon, who were to build the first 35 Westerns, and also Crewe, who were to build the last 39. However, various problems with the final design details meant that the first member of the class wasn't delivered until December 1961. That's a great sound. Made that music, <laughs> as they call it. It's what they come to see. What I'll do is I'll slow it down in the tunnel because the... for the sound. For those of you who love the sound of a diesel hydraulic, I strongly suggest you turn up the volume on your TV now. is fantastic. One unusual design problem on the Westerns concerned the windscreen wipers when in use at high speed. Some were fitted with an experimental rotary wiper of a design used on ships. Although these types of wipers swept away the water, they produced an opaque film on the windscreen and because of this the project was cancelled. The Westerns have a 2,700 horsepower engine. The first withdrawals of the class occurred in May 1973 with Western Challenger and Western Marksman. The last five Westerns were all withdrawn on the 28th of February 1977, the last of the Western Region diesel hydraulics. We won't get the signal till we pass that whistle board now. Do the locals not mind the no, trains it, around here? It, it's actually created a lot of uh, business and commerce since we arrived in 87. It was just tumbleweed when we did arrive. Um, and all the shops are now open Sundays. They have street markets. Christmas, it's all blocked off with Christmas markets. And it was just, um, there was nothing really before the railway arrived. And oh, it's nice. all built up since then. So it's amazing, it's a, really. Brought a bit of economy to the area. Yeah, it has actually, yeah. Now here's something you don't see that often. A double-headed train pulled by two great, great Western diesel hydraulics locomotives. At the front, D1023 Western Fusilier, uh, built at Swindon in the early 1960s, part of a fleet of 74 diesel hydraulics that worked the Western region on the mainline trains between Paddington and Bristol and Paddington down to Devon and Cornwall. Behind it, D832, Onslaught, part of the warship class.
So, you're in the pub having a pint with your mates as you do, and one of them says, hey, wouldn't it be a great idea to rebuild the railway that last ran in the Glen 20 years ago? And you go, yeah, that would be a great idea. And you go home and you wake up the next day with a hangover. Would you still go ahead and build that railway? Oh, by the way, here's the catch. It's 500 yards to the nearest road. Well, luckily for us, that's exactly what a group of men did do. Enthusiasts in search of a railway, they decided to take matters into their own hands and rebuilt the Victorian Groudle Glen Railway. This dramatic two-foot gauge railway is situated on the east coast of the Isle of Man. Tony, where to start? It was um, my first thought. It was a bit of a walk from the road to here. Yeah. And yet you've got a railway here. There's no other entrance, is there? No, there's no other, no other entrance. You come past uh, through the glen to the railway station from the main road. That's so, the only way. So, how did you do it? <laughs> how did we put the railway back? Well, yeah. Same as the Victorians. Yeah. We physically had to bring things over the fields to its nearest point to the railway from the main road. It is a great problem for them, and it is for us today. OK, well now, uh, the Victorians, it's a fascinating history, isn't it, of this it is, line? It is, yeah. Uh, just run through it, when it was built and, and why. Well, basically, the, uh, a local businessman called Richard Morby Broadbent saw the potential of bringing the Victorian holidaymaker to this area called Groudle. And the first thing he did was to actually uh, develop the paths so that big people could walk down to the beach. And then he built a zoo where there were sea lions and polar bears and other sorts of animals. I mean, would it be fair to say this was the Victorian equivalent of Alton Towers? It would be, really, because there were all sorts of entertainment in the Glen. There was yeah. a big dance hall. There was a band played there every day. Yeah. And there were entertainments especially put on at night. And in the early years, there were boxing matches as well, from what we understand. And so, as part of the attraction, he then built the railway to take people out to the zoo. Yeah. And the, the, the railway opened in uh, 1896. Well, um, sort of almost inevitably, you know, what with world wars and what have you, it fell into disrepair, didn't it? Yeah, it did, yes. Uh, but uh, more remarkably, you brought it back to life. One bit of the site that the Grand Glen Railway have not uh, restored. Uh, you have to admire Broadbent's ingenuity, although maybe his uh, kindness to animals is questionable. He had a zoo built here. Unbelievable but true. That over there is the sea lion pen and up there that's where the polar bears lived. There was a footbridge and you can see the remains down there that connected the two parts of the Glen. Oh, I don't know how he got the polar bears up there. Maybe he brought them in by boat, led them up the cliffs there. Who knows? They were definitely there. One of them escaped one night. The other remarkable thing is uh, Sea Lion, the locomotive that's uh, pulling this train, yeah. built for the line, yeah. <coughs> back on it again. How, right. how did that happen? Well, again, she, she was lying derelict. So last time she was used in 1939, and uh, that was it, and she lay derelict for a number of years, and eventually she ended up in, in Loughborough. And we talked to the gentleman who had the engine at the time, and he agreed to... Uh, give sea lion back to us, providing we could get it restored. And by a lucky coincidence, we had a contact in uh, British Nuclear Fields, Sellafield in Cumbria, where they have a bigger train apprentice training college. Mm. And he got us an introduction there, and I went over with one or two colleagues, and uh, they agreed to build a new boiler for the engine, and later they said, well, we'll restore the whole thing. And over the next three or four years, they actually rebuilt the engine, and it came back in late 1987, fully restored and back on its original line. Polar Bear still exists, doesn't yep, it? The other it does, engine yeah. that was built yeah, for the line. That was taken away in, uh, in 1966 and, and taken to England and now lives in a museum called the Ambley Chalk Pits Museum in Sussex. She's been back here a couple of times. Mm. We had her back for 1993 for a special do and then when this railway was uh, 100 years old she came back for the whole summer and uh, so it was great to have the two engines uh, back together again.
this is St. Philip's Marsh in Bristol, one of First Great Western's major depots. Now on your way home from the station, do you ever wonder what happens to your train? Well, it's got to be cleaned, it's got to be maintained, and it's also got to be refuelled. And it takes a dedicated team of technicians working right through the night to make sure your train is ready for you first thing in the morning. Now, Steve Overton, you're the production manager here at St Philip's Marsh in Bristol. How many units do First Great Western have in their fleet? They've got uh, 38 HSTs in, in total, uh, and out of that every day we have to provide 35 for service. So we've only got three spare, so it's quite a tight operation. And how many are you going to have through here tonight? We're going to have 14 through here tonight. So how often do they have to come in to be maintained? Yeah, they have a service check. Uh, we try and get a service check done on them every day where they're fueled and uh, they actually have to come over a pit uh, every three days for what we call an A exam where the guys go underneath and check the running gear. And what, what will the guys be looking for? The guys will be underneath, they'll be examining all the running gear, they go right underneath, check the brake pads, check the discs. Um, we have artisans, they'll go up, do the fuel, the power cars, they go through the tops, check the engines, check the lube oils, check the coolant, right. look over the cooler groups, and we have other guys who check the doors, operation of the doors, check the windows, and check the interiors. What's the average mileage it would do in a day, for instance? Average diagram for an HST these days is around 900 to 1,000 miles a day. A day? A day, yeah. Do you do refuelling here at the depot as well, Steve? Yeah, we refuel, um, we refuel every power car every day. Every day it comes in. How many uh, litres or gallons does one of these units hold? When they're empty, yeah, uh, to, to fill the tank right up takes 4,500 litres on there, but uh, obviously we try not to let them run out every day. <laughs> <laughs> Now, of course, in the shed you can't have the engines running, so how do you power up one of these, uh, these trains? Right, as soon as they come in the shed, uh, we shut the engines down, obviously, to uh, cut down on the smoke nuisance and the noise pollution. Uh, what we do then is we, we plug them in on a, on a shore supply, lighting, heating, air conditioning runs on the sets, and we put an air supply on them as well, so we can test the brakes without causing any noise problems. Right. So basically it's just plug it into the main sort of thing? Basically just plug it into the mains. It's a 415 volt supply. Now the maintenance on one of these 125 units I suppose is, uh, is old fashioned compared to the new class 180s? Yep, they're, uh, they're a train now that's some 25 years old uh, HST, but uh, the 180 certainly is uh, it's a giant leap forward in technology for, for most of us on the depots. All the faults are logged on a 180 and uh, we, we download the train management system every night and, and analyse the data and that tells us what to do to it. And the computer will tell you, look at my discs, they're a bit worn. That's right, it will tell us exactly what to do with it, whereas an HST we've actually got to go and look for the faults. <laughs> Now, once they've been checked and they're ready to go out, they've got to be out on time as well. People don't realise that either, do they? They have, yeah. It's very tight on the way in. There's only 20-minute leeways on most trains into service, uh, around onto the depot. Um, once they've been in here, it's down through the wash plant then, uh, down into Victoria sidings, where the cleaning operation takes place. So, uh, dirty train in one end and clean train out the other end. As far as railways in Britain are concerned, we're quite good at turning around quite quickly, aren't we? We are, if we compare ourselves to other railways in the world. We seem to have a fair few units laying around for maintenance and that. So uh, we do really well. Fly the flag. Early. Definitely. <laughs> Newspapers here burger wrappers, coffee cups, there's a blocked toilet back there by the way. Also somebody at seats 9, 10, 11 and 12 has been having a bit of a party it looks like. Steve, nobody ever notices a clean carriage do they? People always get on trains and say oh isn't it filthy? Yeah so that's right. these guys here they seem to whip through don't they? Yeah they have to uh, do the tables, uh, do the windows, uh, hoover, every, uh, hoover every carpet, uh, wipe the seats over, 
and the toilets vestibule ends. So they only get about 40, 45 minutes per train. It's not the most glamorous job in the world, either. It certainly is it? isn't, and it's hard work. And they're but all it's... on permanent nights down here as well. So they must find some unusual things. Yeah, we've found a fair few bits and pieces that we've found. Um, we've, we've, we find wallets, we find suitcases. We've actually had a briefcase full of, uh, full of money, which is uh, probably enough to retire on. But uh, we really? handed that into the system, yeah. So yeah, we what... give everything back. We give everything back, but... Um, Oh, we're in the way now. OK, well, <laughs> let's, let's move on. This is what it's all about. It's now um, 3 o'clock in the morning. It's all cleaned, all serviced, all ready to go. An empty train with nobody on it. This is the rewarding part of the job, the end product. Doing. Nothing. You're not going to find any money, you know. I'm not looking for any money. And even if you did find some, you have to hand it back in. Yeah, I would. And give that bloke his briefcase back. What briefcase? Oh. Sorry, mate. <clears throat> 